Okay, let's begin. So uh, we are, we are looking at predicate logic. We have looked at the definition of structures. I have just written that definition down on the screen so that you remember that you as you start with a non-empty universe, and for each symbol in your predicate language, you have some appropriate data as in a subset of appropriate arity, a function of appropriate arity for a relation symbol and function symbol and a specific element for a constant symbol. Okay. So, this is the data and what we are going to do now is look at some substructures. So, you know that for example, a linear order is a structure in which language? A language consisting of just one binary relation symbol. Then a group is a structure yeah, in an appropriate language. Then a vector space is a structure in an appropriate language. Correct? All of these are structures. And associated with that, you always have a suborder, a subgroup a subspace yeah so they all fall under the same category so i just thought i will show you how that happens so given two l structures m and n well when i write this uh, i think you understand when i write dot 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 what does that mean all this extra data yeah i just write down the name of the symbol for the universe, but I do not write other things. Say that N is a substructure of M written n is a substructure of m if can you tell me some something what should we do with relation symbols yes so if for all if first of all n should be a subset of m yeah, it is a substructure, so it should be a subset to begin with. Then second thing, for each relation symbol, R of arity M, what can I say about R n? So, which tuples are in the relation uh, the interpretation of the relation in N, they are precisely, I mean this is an induced relation. So, it should be, you interpret it in Rm and then you only take those tuples which lie in N to the power M. Okay. Then next thing for each function symbol f of arity n, what should happen? What should be f n? f n is precisely the function f m restricted to n to the power n. Yeah, I mean restricted and co-restricted. So, Okay, uh, and for each constant symbol, what should I write? If you talk about a subspace of a vector space, yeah, what happens to a zero to the zero? The zero of the bigger space should lie inside the zero of the uh, should lie inside the smaller space, right? So same thing we are going to write. For each constant symbol C, Cm belongs to N 
and Cn is equal to Cm. Okay, the constant symbol in the larger structure should be interpreted as an element of the smaller structure and the interpretation should agree. Okay. Any questions about this? So, now tell me, so for example, given M and N L set structures, L set structures, N is a substructure of M, if and only if what will happen? Correct, N is a subset of M, because there is no relation symbol, no function symbol, no constant symbol. Okay, so that was example number 1. Now, uh, given L ORD structures, M equal to M comma RM and N equal to N comma RN. N is a substructure of M if and only if if and only if n is a subset of m and rn is equal to rm intersection n square it is a binary relation symbol n square so in case of posets, what we are talking about? I mean, suppose this M and N are posets. So, for example, yeah, I mean, in, in particular, I am going to use a different color now. If I tell you that this is my A, B, C. Yeah, so, it is a three element linear order, then is this, if this is my n and this is my m, yeah, this is an anti chain, is this a substructure? No. So, what we need is that it should be an induced substructure, correct? So, this is not a substructure. Because what happens? A and B are not related here, but they are related here. So, do you remember a term like this inclusion has to be what? This is a monotone map. The inclusion is monotone map, but what do we need it? Order embedding. It should also reflect order, right? So, that is the property. So, in particular for posets, For posets N and M, N is a subset of M if and only if, uh, sorry, N is a subset of M and the inclusion map from N to M is an order embedding. Okay, so, we are not talking about other subsets, I mean this is an arbitrary subset where the inclusion is order preserving, but not order reflecting, okay? fine. So, let us go to the third one, now given LGR structures, do you remember what is LGR? I should give you M, then what should I give you? F from M square to M and G is a unary function symbol for inverse. Uh, so, F M, G M from M to M and then 
E M in M and you write down N's similarly. Okay? Then we say that N is a subset of M if and only if, I mean I am not going to write it, but if there are groups uh, that are, if I say that these are groups, yeah, then N is subset of M if and only if N is a subgroup of M. So, for example, integers are a subgroup of rational numbers as an abelian group, right? Because sum of two integers, so what does this condition say? Yeah, this fn is, rest, is restriction of fm. It says that this uh, subset n is closed under the action of fm. You have heard the word closed? Yeah, when you talk about a subspace of a vector space, then you say it is closed under the induced scalar multiplication and induced addition. So, everything is about induced. So, I am trying to give you a feel how logic brings everything together under one umbrella. Right? So, n is a subgroup. Here it was an order embedding, I mean it was a strong induced subposet. Yeah, maybe I should write it. Yeah, so this is called induced subposet. Okay. So here it is subgroup for vector spaces, it will be subspace. So everything, whenever you have a prefix sub. Yeah, more or less it can be expressed in some logic, not necessarily finite, but it can be expressed. Finitary logic is not necessary. Okay, I am not giving you any more examples, but here we talked about something. Yeah, I from n to m is an order embedding. Well, whenever we talk about structures, at the same time we should talk about the morphisms which preserve structures. So, we have seen Boolean algebras. Boolean algebra homomorphism, lattice, lattice homomorphism, poset, poset, uh, like order preserving maps, right? So, all of those things we should talk about. So, given L structures M and N. Uh, a morphism alpha from M to N is a function F from the universe of M to the universe of N, curly N satisfying the following data. First one, yeah, I mean it is a function first of all that I have said. So, for each relation symbol what should happen? For each relation symbol R of arity M, Can you tell me what will happen? What should alpha do? Oh, sorry, it is a function alpha, not I should not be using f. Yeah, I'll, f is reserved for a function symbol. So, right now we are using a different symbol. For each relation symbol R of arity m, I mean relation symbol, think about order relation. If x is less than, if a is less equal b, then you say that alpha a is less equal alpha b. Yeah, so we should talk about that. And a bar in m, 
right? We have A bar belongs to R m implies, uh, sorry, maybe I should not use this notation because I am prohibiting you from doing so. So, if A bar belongs to R m, then F or so alpha of A 1, alpha of A 2 up to alpha of A m, this is what we will call alpha of A bar belongs to R m. Yeah, alpha A bar is the shortcut to write this. Component wise apply alpha. Any question? Second condition for each function symbol f of arity n and a bar in m. Now, a bar is a tuple of length little n. What will we have? Well, we can first say f m applied on a 1, a 2, a n that we can do and then we can say okay, this is a single element of m, I can apply alpha on it, but this is same as well, I will first apply alpha on each individual pair and now this is a tuple in n. So, I can apply f n. So, this should happen. Now, if you think about it, vector space addition, yeah, vector space addition and you talk about a linear map. What does a linear map do? Well, it takes addition and it maps it to addition of the images. The image of addition image of sum is sum of images that is what we are writing here. It is just a more fancy way because we are talking about arbitrarily arbitrary n array function symbols. And finally, what should happen for constant symbols? For each constant symbol uh, C, we have alpha of C m is equal to C n. I mean uh, you also require that a vector space 0 yeah, is preserved by the linear map, yeah, 0 maps to 0, well that is what we are saying here. Right? So, uh, now let us try to do some examples. In L set, what is a morphism? Oh, uh, oh, wait, I should say homomorphism, yeah, L structure homomorphism or oh, maybe I should do one more thing. Yes, so what is an isomorphism as well? I can write it down in the same definition. Can you tell me what should be the isomorphism? Bijective, yes. It should be a bijective function. Then for each relation symbol R of arity M and A bar in M, what should happen? <coughs> or we just say this is if and only if. It is not if then, it is if and only if, both ways. And then the rest do not matter, they are going to remain same, okay, only here we needed to make a change. So, bijective map which has if and only if in the relation symbol condition, okay. 
So now let me give you an example. L set uh, structure homomorphism. I am going to write HM for homomorphism is what? What should it be? L set L set structure homomorphism. It's just a function. Yeah, is a function. So functions also we are generalizing, right? Functions are also homomorphisms. There is no structure, but that doesn't mean it doesn't preserve structure. Yeah, it preserves no structure, so it is a homomorphism. Okay, then L odd structure homomorphism between posets. Is, is a monotone map. Okay. Then what about this? Yeah, I am going to give you an interesting example. So let me call it this. It should contain one binary function symbol and one constant. So L is equal to uh, F binary and C unary. Yeah? Then from natural numbers comma plus and 0, I can send it to natural numbers comma multiplication comma 1. What should be the map? Can you think of any? If I do n mapping to 2 to the power n, you understand? So n mapping to 2 to the power n, this is exponential map, yeah, I mean 2 to the power n and can you tell me what it is? So 2 to the power n1 plus n2 maps to? It is 2 to the power n1 times 2 to the power n2. So the structure is preserved and also 0 maps to 1. So this is an injective homomorphism. And what about this now? R plus 0 to R plus comma dot comma 1. If I write down the exponential map e to the power x. This is this is an isomorphism. Yeah, e is an isomorphism. Yeah, so I tried to give you one non-trivial example of an isomorphism. Exponential is always an isomorphism from the set of real numbers to set of positive real numbers. Any questions here? So you understand homomorphism, substructures. So our, I mean uh, lot of algebra, I mean algebra is a general term, okay. Algebra does not always refer to the things that you study in algebra course. Yeah, in algebra course, you study vector spaces, then groups, rings, fields. Not only those things are algebraic structures. Even relations are algebraic structure. So anything that is finitary in nature, any symbol that is finitary, that is algebra in a general sense. There is also a branch of mathematics called universal algebra, which studies all these things. So a homomorphism is when we are talking about structure preserving maps and these are all algebraic structures yeah there is nothing infinitary happening here even orders are algebraic lattice homomorphisms they will also be homomorphisms in this sense yeah then boolean algebras everything that we have done so far 
that is encompassed under this notion that comes together under one umbrella yeah except for i mean you haven't studied topological spaces yet but topological spaces do not fit into this because of the condition that arbitrary union of open sets is open is a clause that that is not finitary and it is about subsets yeah so we cannot quantify over subsets so it's a strictly higher order structure yeah it's not a first order structure any questions okay so then we can start with something new now i am going to write down a theorem and i am not going to do a proof but i will give it to you as an exercise this this is again a proof like substitution theorem where the proof is really long but it is straight forward if you know exactly what you are supposed to do then you will do it okay so this is called dependency theorem okay suppose l is a language m is an l structure phi x bar is a formula and a bar and b bar are in m okay so you are given this much data if ai is equal to bi for all xi belonging to the set of free variables of phi you remember the set of free variables yeah the variables which are not bound normally i mean we can say that x square plus y square minus 1 equal to uh, equal to 0 is a polynomial equation in x y z but z doesn't appear right so therefore we can have much more larger context than the set of free variables itself so if ai is equal to bi for all xi in the set of free variables then m satisfies phi at a bar if and only if m satisfies phi at b bar looks obvious yeah but the proof is long what is the method of proof induction, induction on the complexity yeah you you just have to go through it yeah it uh, i can write it down but it is just unnecessary i feel you can learn more interesting mathematics instead of doing this in the class okay so what we are saying is that the truth of the formula doesn't really depend on the variables which are not free in your formula okay x square plus y square minus uh, 1 is equal to 0 the truth of that formula will not depend on value of z if i give you 1 2 3 and 1 2 4 then 3 and 4 those those elements don't matter this is simple yeah how do you do it by using induction you do you need to prove anything for terms first anything that is about formulas yeah you have to prove a similar statement for terms can you tell me a similar statement for terms
if t is a term in context x bar and a bar and b bar are arbitrary tuples such that a i is equal to b i for all x i belonging to the variables which occur in t. Then the value of the term at a bar is going to be same as the value of the term at b bar. So there is equality and equality in the case of terms is replaced by if and only if condition in the case of formulas. Okay, so you had to prove that first and then you had to come here and prove this. Okay. Now, okay. I am going to write down a bunch of definitions, they are not new for you. Yeah. So, suppose gamma of x bar subset of f l is a set of formulas in context x bar. So, this gamma of x bar could be infinite. The only condition that we need is that the number of variables which could occur in that infinite collection of formulas is still finite. That, that is again from x bar. Yeah, so, let us say I am talking about infinitely many polynomials at the same time, but they are all polynomials in x and y. Yeah, so, this finiteness is important, gamma itself could be infinite. Okay. So, say that gamma is satisfiable if tell me when it when should it be satisfiable if there if there exists a if there exists a valuation what is a valuation? Did we define a valuation? I mean indirectly we did, yes, there exists a? Some a bar belonging to m and where is m coming from? If there exists, yeah, if there is an L structure m and a bar in m such that m satisfies phi x bar for each phi x bar in gamma x bar. So, each formula in that collection is satisfied by some tuple in some structure. You understand this? So, this definition, I mean right now you are not really worried about uh, knowing what is the actual meaning of satisfiability, right? You know that from propositional logic which was the baby version of this, we said, oh there is a valuation which makes every formula true. Now, here the truth is dependent. The valuation that somebody talked about earlier, the valuation is this pair m and a bar. Right? If there is a valuation m and a bar which satisfies phi. For each phi. Yeah, I mean there also we did the same thing. We said that capital S is satisfiable if there is a valuation which makes every little s from capital S true. So, here also there is for each thing and the valuation is a structure comma tuple. Okay. Yes? 
we need that a bar because we cannot talk about truth. Can you say that phi is true in m? You can't, right? Yes, for and, and some tuple which makes it true. Yeah, otherwise we can't say that. If I am given uh, this formula x less than y. No, I think you say like why did we write uh, m mod l phi of a bar? Oh, phi of a bar, sorry, not x bar. I bar, sorry, phi, phi at, uh, yeah. Again, phi is satisfiable in m at a bar. For all the formulas, there should be a common A bar. Yeah, it is not like for individual formula, we choose a different A bar. Yeah, this A bar does not depend on phi. Yeah, that is the most important thing. Any questions? So, for example, if I give you the set of polynomials in one variable, over integers with constant term 0. Is it satisfiable? The set of polynomials in Zx with constant term 0, is it satisfiable or not? Yes. Those are terms, how can they be satisfied? Oh, I mean uh, polynomial equations, sorry. Uh, maybe I should say Px bar equal to 0 with constant term 0. Is it satisfiable? Yes. Why? Zero. 0 satisfies it, correct. You understand, I mean, I am not making sense here, I have not written the language, I have not written the polynomials properly, but you, you get the sense. Yeah, I am not writing polynomials as bracket, bracket, bracket and things. Yeah, I should do that, but this is satisfiable, you understand, because 0 satisfies it, right. So, when do you say that it is unsatisfiable or Right. So, unsatisfiable, I think you can make sense of it. If, I mean negation of this, yeah, what is it? There is, there is a quantifier over here. So, there is a quantifier. If there exists an L structure, so the negation would be for all L structures, the inside part does not happen. Yeah, for all L structures M and for all A bar in M, there is a formula, yeah, this for all is also negated, there is a formula phi in gamma such that phi is not true in M at A bar. You understand? Do you want me to write it down? Okay. Fine, I will write it down. So, say that gamma of x bar is unsatisfiable if it is not satisfiable, i.e. For each L structure M and A bar in M, there is some phi x bar in gamma x bar such that M does not satisfy phi at A bar. You give me one formula, I will give you another thing. Yeah, so, for example, yeah, one 
what about this x equal to 0 and x plus 1 is equal to 0 is it unsatisfiable If 1 is equal to 0, then it is not unsatisfiable, right? So, I mean, unsatisfiability is a very strong condition. Yeah, it's still satisfiable. It's satisfiable. Uh, in a structure where, uh, in a structure M where 1 M is equal to 0 M. Right? So, but something like this, negation x equal to x, is this satisfiable or unsatisfiable? Yeah, unsatisfiable, it can never be true. For every tuple you, uh, for every a, little a, in any structure m, you will always have a equal to a. So, this is an obviously unsatisfiable. So, see you have to be creative, yeah, satisfiability is not an easy condition to verify. If 1 and 0 are the same, yeah, you have to think about all possibilities at the same time. Any questions? One, 1 and 0 are right now, they are just symbols. Yeah, so 1 and 0 can be interpreted as any elements. If they are interpreted as the same element, then obviously this won't happen. Okay, any other questions? All right. Now, there is one more definition missing satisfiable, unsatisfiable and there is always satisfiable. What is that? Tautology. Tautology. So, let us define that now. Is tautologous if, can you tell me what the definition should be? For all L structures, yes, for all L structures M and and for all A bar in M, what should happen? M satisfies phi at A bar for all phi X bar in gamma x bar. Okay, one simple example is what I already give you, gave you, just do its negation, x equal to x is tautologous. Yeah, this is okay? Good. So, uh, now these conditions actually become a bit easier when you are not talking about formulas but just sentences. You understand sentences? Sentences are formulas without free variables. So, how, what will this read like? A set of sentences gamma is satisfiable if for all, if, if there is an M structure, L structure M such that M such that phi is true in M for all phi in gamma. You understand? So, for sentences it is easy because sentences are either true or false without having to worry about what the assignment is. Okay. Now, Based on this idea, we are going to define something very interesting and perhaps this is not a surprise to you, say that 
gamma subset of S L is a theory if gamma is satisfiable. Is this a surprise? No. Okay. Then if gamma is a theory and m satisfies gamma, m satisfies gamma means what? m satisfies phi for each phi in gamma i.e. m satisfies phi for each phi in gamma, then we say that m is a model of the theory gamma, not the theory of theory gamma. Yeah, this is where the origin of the word model theory comes from. Model theory is a branch of mathematics, mathematical logic which studies these things. So we don't worry too much about syntax, syntax is always there to help us, but we only care about dissatisfaction relation, yeah, that is model theory. So now we are going to write down various examples of theories. Okay. So, first example, in L ord, yeah, suppose gamma is empty. Is empty set satisfiable? Yes or no? Please raise your hands if you think yes. Only three people and the rest of you are thinking it is not satisfiable. See what is the meaning of satisfiable? Please check. There is a condition for each formula but there is no formula. So it is always true at everything. Yeah? In every structure it is true, empty set. Okay. Then a model of such a theory is called a directed graph. Any arbitrary L odd structure is simply a directed graph. Okay, what is a graph, directed graph? Yeah? A graph is simply a set with a binary relation. That binary relation, if A comma B belongs to R, then you draw an arrow from A to B. So that is how it becomes a directed graph. So for example, so example within an example, okay. So suppose m is equal to 1, 2, 3, comma, now I have to give you a set of two element subsets hmm? and Rm equal to, well I will say 1, 2, then 1, 1 and then 3, 1, 2, 1 and 3, 1 and then I will close this. So those should be ordered. <coughs> yes, okay, thank you. I should always write this and then there should not be a last parenthesis, right? Uh, 
okay then we how do we present it then we draw the we draw this digraph directed graph is also known as a digraph yeah this digraph as well i have 1 2 and 3 then i will have an arrow from 1 to 2 then i will have an arrow from 2 to 1 i will have an arrow from 3 to 1 and i have a loop from 1 to 1 so this is a directed graph there are no conditions at all okay any questions now if i include yeah i mean we are looking at the same language so if gamma is the set of sentences set of three sentences expressing i'm not going to write it again okay uh, reflexivity transitivity and symmetry symmetricity then a model of gamma is is what a set with an equivalence relation a set with an equivalence relation is m equal to m comma e where e is an equivalence relation on m so this gamma is i can write it as gamma eq r e l yeah so this is the theory of equivalence relations is it satisfiable where in every equivalence relation yeah in every structure that is an equivalence relation this is satisfiable okay maybe i should write this suppose gamma is equal to so here i can write maybe gamma d graph di digraphs yeah so this is the theory of directed graphs we studied simple graphs yeah while studying uh, application of compactness theorem what are simple graphs irreflexive, irreflexive and symmetric. symmetric yes so if so if gamma so simple graph is the set of sentences expressing irreflexivity and symmetry city then i mean first of all it is uh, it is satisfiable yeah you know why it is satisfiable because there are simple graphs a model of gamma simp graph is a simple graph g equal to v comma e okay the next example i am going to say something out loud which is weird to hear so group theory is the collection of the three sentences one which expresses associativity then identity and inverse so a group is a model of the group theory of groups okay the word group did not come first the theory of groups comes first and then we say a group is a model of the theory of groups right i mean i i should also write perhaps here uh, if i tell you gamma poset can you write down what are the sentences 
yeah reflexivity transitivity and antisymmetry and the model for that would be opposite yeah this is a model then uh, so this is in language l or perhaps i should make a table i did not think of that if i write down lgr and uh, the language of groups which is oh perhaps maybe i should this is two language of groups i should write down f g and e this is zero this is one this is two and i should express the sentences associativity yeah so this is gamma group is associativity then identity and inverse then what is the model on this side so this is the uh, these are the sentences this is the notation of theory and this is the language i'm doing a really bad job of writing okay so uh, the model is called a group perhaps for everybody's uh, convenience i should write down one of the axioms yeah so for example i will write the inverse axiom for all w1 there is no i don't need to there uh, say there is yeah i should just say for all w1 this sum of w1 and g of w1 is equal to e and the sum of g of w1 and w1 is equal to e and this is complete so i just want to remind you that whenever you are writing down these sentences you should always use the variables w because they are bound variables okay then well you can write down the axioms for the theory of vector spaces yeah l r vect what does it consist of one binary then one unary and one symbol which is scalar multiplication for each element in the in here then you write down the theory of vector spaces gamma r vect this is the theory of vector spaces it talks about associativity identity oh i should also add uh, one g yeah which is for inverse associativity identity then inverse then what else should you require commutativity yes then you should also require bunch of other statements yeah for example if i say mr of ms of w yeah for all w mr of ms of w is mr plus s of w yeah some conditions like this should also be included these are i mean by the way the elements i did not write that but i will yeah uh just a moment yes m r into s m r into s and then we also have the corresponding things for addition yeah you have more conditions here around 10 10 of them then um, scalar multiplication distributes over addition yeah you should also be able to express all those things and then the model corresponding model is called an r vector space let me go back a bit when i was defining a theory yeah so 
the sentences so this is perhaps in red sentences in a theory are called axioms of gamma yeah that is where the word axiom also comes into picture a theory is theory consists of axioms so the axiom for associativity axiom for reflexivity yeah that is how we have learnt it any questions so far everything is clear okay then uh, we can also express in appropriate languages i am not going to write down too many names now yeah and there are more more axioms here also but if i have if i start using uh, languages like this like both of them are binary symbols and then there is uh c and e which are zero array symbols if this is my language then i can write down the theory of lattices yeah uh, bound lattices yeah so you can i can say bound lattice what will i write for bound lattice do you remember lattice means both operations are both gamma and uh, so both uh, meet and join are are associative commutative then idempotent idempotent then there is absorption laws yes absorption laws then c is minimum yes so c is minimum e is maximum how do you express something is minimum for all w c is a uh, like c meet c meet w is equal to c very good so you know what to do now yeah so finally the model is called a bounded lattice and you can express in similar ways by adding more symbols if necessary or removing symbols if necessary semi lattices bounded semi lattices then distributive lattices modular lattices boolean algebras yeah wherever you have bunch of axioms they are all theories in appropriate languages right so if i ask you to write down theory of a particular structure you should be able to do that yeah it's easy okay so given a set gamma x bar subset of f and a formula psi x bar in fl say that a uh, psi x bar is a logical consequence of gamma x bar if yeah we have seen uh, and sorry sorry written gamma x bar models psi x bar if i mean can you recall the definition from propositional logic t is a logical consequence of capital s if whenever v models s then v models t now we are going to do exactly the same thing what is the meaning of a model here 
there is a structure and a tuple okay if whenever m is an l structure and a a bar is in m such that m satisfies gamma at a bar then m satisfies psi at a bar you understand m satisfies gamma at a bar it means m satisfies phi at a bar for each phi in gamma same definition yeah we haven't changed anything and uh, for sentences again this is simpler yeah so in particular if gamma is a subset of sl and psi belongs to sl say that psi is a logical consequence of gamma if whenever uh, m is an l structure and m models gamma so m is a model of the theory gamma then m satisfies psi but see in this definition i never said that gamma has to be satisfiable if gamma is unsatisfiable then gamma will always logically imply psi yeah because again the same idea yeah that it will generate the entire filter okay i use the word filter so for filter there should be a boolean algebra somewhere where is the boolean algebra here what should we do here Hmm? we should define the notion of logical equivalence yes so let us do that while we are here so yeah say that formulas phi x bar and psi x bar are logically equivalent if whenever a m is an l structure and a bar is a tuple in m then m satisfies phi at a bar what should i write if and only if m satisfies psi at a bar okay so simple enough definition then when you take logical equivalence classes of formulas then you will get a boolean algebra because of f2 just f2 alone is sufficient for that yeah we will talk more about it in the next lecture but uh, let me come back to theories yeah so say that a theory gamma is a complete theory if for each psi in sl either psi is a logical consequence of gamma or negation psi is a logical consequence of gamma tell me 
whether both of them can simultaneously happen. Yeah? Can you prove that? Then it won't be satisfiable, yeah? So, suppose, so we know that it is a theory. Theory means it is satisfiable. So, let M be a model of gamma. If both of them happen, then M models psi and M models negation psi, well, that's a contradiction. So, therefore, both of them cannot happen. But in an incomplete theory, in an incomplete theory, what can happen that there is some gamma, as there is some psi, such that gamma doesn't entail psi and gamma doesn't entail negation psi. Yeah? So, complete theory essentially makes decisions for everything. For every sentence, it makes a decision. And what condition does this remind you of? Psi and negation psi? Ultra filters. Correct. So, these are precisely ultra filters. And I need to give you one example of this. Obviously, if I am writing a theory, for example, for any structure M, theory of M defined as all those sentences psi in SL such that M models psi is complete. Okay, if I am given a four element group Z mod, mod 4 Z, okay, then I will take every single sentence which is true in that structure and well the collection of all such sentences is a complete theory because it already made a decision. So, what happens in this case is that so, psi, so uh, theory of M models psi if and only if M models psi, right? So, therefore, for every sentence, M will always make a decision. Yeah, a structure, a given sentence is either true in the structure or it is false. So, a structure always makes decisions. So, therefore, the theory of a structure is always complete. Now, just take a moment. We proved completeness theorem in the case of propositional logic. But I emphasized on the fact that that completeness theorem and soundness theorem, they were about the proof system, proof calculus. But there is also Gödel's incompleteness theorem and that incompleteness does not have to do with a proof system, but it has to do with completeness, incompleteness of a theory. It is the same word, but totally different contexts. Okay? Our last lecture will be about Gödel's incompleteness theorems. So, there we will talk about certain theories being incomplete. Now, just before we leave, uh, is any of the theories here complete? Theory of directed graphs, is that complete? No, it is not. It is empty. Gamma is empty. So, if I say that for every element, there is an arrow from that node. How do I express something like that? So, this is not complete, yeah? If I write that for all W1, there exists a W2 such that R W1 W2. Now, this is a sentence. So, let psi denote this sentence. Then psi is not decided by gamma digraphs. Yeah, then since for psi equal to this, 
gamma digraph does not entail psi and gamma digraph does not entail negation psi. How do we decide this whether it entails or not? Well, there is a model, there is a directed graph for which psi is true and there is a directed graph for which negation psi is true. So, therefore, we cannot decide it. You understand? We will continue talking about it in the next lecture yeah? and uh, we will talk more about models and theories.